Good morning, boys and girls. It is the 21st. Here's a shout out to my Serbian friends. They'll all get a kick out of that one. Um, so, back on the, uh, the dog walk. The dog. Okay, so you got your dog moment. And a little more. <laughs> so, what are we covering today? Um, well, we can start with the brilliant diplomacy of Vladimir Vladimirovich, uh, who one, uh, turned the tables on uh, Zelensky and his American backers by saying, yeah, we're ready to, we're ready to talk, which he's been saying always, but uh, the new conditions are Ukraine leaves all the Russian territories, the new Russian territories, the new old Russian territories, because they're, they're old, old Russian territories that the communists, uh, when they were creating these republics, divvied up from uh, Russia into this artificial thing called Ukraine. So, just really returning old Russian territories. Um, and then we'll talk. It's the same thing as uh, Zelensky's been saying, that, you know, go back to 1991 borders. Well, I don't think he meant the, uh, the Soviet 1991 borders. But, uh, and then we'll talk. Well, no. Boys and girls, things are not like that, and this is how it's going to be. Of course, uh, the West uh, poo-pooed it instantly, and which was meant to be, because this is uh, this was more to show the rest of the world that we're ready to talk. We know the West isn't, and they won't. So we're ready to talk, but since they're not ready to talk, we'll just continue uh, pushing westward. Um, come hell or high water, and if the West wants to uh, bring in NATO, by all means, bring it in. We'll bury them just the same. So. Um, and then Vladimir Vladimirovich went to North Korea. And you see, the problem with uh, his going to North Korea is that, unfortunately, Russia, for a very long time, uh, had included itself in the uh, sanctions regime against North Korea and Iran, uh, which finally has said, uh, well, no, this is stupid and we're no longer going to support any of those sanctions. And as the West, the, the West's little clown show, jumping up and down screaming, oh, they just had, they sang Russian songs, and they had a red carpet, and then they ate dinner, and they talked, and they got nothing done. Well, no, they actually signed a defense pact, a defense alliance. So if either country is attacked, the other country comes to its aid. That's uh, a defense alliance. So any American or South Korean uh, plans for some kind of quick war or something uh, on the Korean Peninsula against the North Koreans just fell through. <clears throat> so also if NATO comes in, North Korea will join in this fight, whether it be in the Pacific or it'll be directly against uh, NATO. Either way, there'll be another 30 million people in this fight, people that uh, have experience in uh, saying no to the West. So, the South Koreans. Oh, the South Koreans were upset. Oh, they were upset. They were so upset. They said they're not going to review their policy about giving aid to Ukraine. Uh, which policy was that? Was that the policy where you gave them 150,000 uh, rounds? Uh, the first... Uh, 155 millimeter rounds the first go round, or where you gave them half a million the second go round. That's right. By the way, that's the American. Uh, that's the American thing too. Uh, a South Korea and Europe can give uh, aid to Ukraine. North Korea can't give aid to Russia because what's good for the white people isn't good for the white uh, for the white uh, barbarians, the the polar bears, or the uh, brown and uh, yellow, uh, <clears throat> pardon my French, nigga, of the world, that is, everyone else who isn't the white European Westerner, that uh, peninsula of Eurasia that's been parasitic for the rest of the world for the last five, 500 years, a thousand for us. So, yeah, good for the go goose is good for the gander. There you go, folks. And what's the same thing goes with Africa. You know, we're helping Africa put itself on its feet and finally really kick the French out and stop being a vassal of the French and neo-colonialism. When I said doing uh, 
their bidding of raping Africa with white hands, they're just doing it with black hands that they put in power. So yeah, so to the Africans, power to you. These are nationalist uh, organ governments that are looking out for their people. They're looking out for their uh, resources instead of giving it all away to the Frenchies in this case. And this will continue. This will continue. So after they did that little bit of brilliant uh, diplomacy and signed the defense pact, and believe me, believe me, China was involved, even though China wasn't there directly. China was involved, and that's basically now a three, four, four country pact. Uh, five, really, including Iran and Belarus. Uh, and that's growing. This big block is growing, and guess what? It has internal borders, so you can't really split it up. Uh, it's got each other's backs. So if, uh, if the people of the garden, as... Uh, as uh, Borelli said, because, you know, Borelli in a brilliant, brilliant European speech said that the EU is a garden and everybody else lives in a jungle. Well, if the EU garden, that is NATO and its American uh, owners, decide they want to commit mass suicide and throw in Japan and South Korea into that suicide, and maybe the Philippines, because they seem to be tending that way. Well, okay, fine, whatever. We can play that, because we know very well that leadership in the West is uh, deaf to reality. I mean, more stupider people are hard to find, and these people are absolutely deaf to reality. Uh, they either don't believe that there will ever be a nuclear exchange, or believe that they will, no matter what they do, or believe that they will win against uh, Russia. Okay. Because they're now, oh, you know, Russian missiles won't fly. Really? You know, by the way, uh, American intercontinental ballistic missiles are in silos. They've literally had to uh, cut, weld cut those silos open. They rusted shut. I mean, that's the state of American affairs. So one leg of that triad is pretty shortened and broken. I was reading uh, the next... The next uh, missile that's supposed to take the place of the Minuteman 3. The first uh, uh, example, working example of it, is being developed, and you're going to love this, folks, for a neat little cost. So this is uh, for a neat little cost for the first uh, uh, test uh, missile of only $100 billion. $100 billion. I mean, that is just plain friggin insane and each uh, follow-on missile that's going to be now once it hits mass production to replace the Minuteman 3 is only going to run the the US uh, tax peasant 10 billion dollars this is to a country that just from servicing its debt at 5.5 uh, percent interest rate is whopping on another trillion dollars in debt that then needs to be serviced every four and quickly sliding toward three months so right now the u.s debt is growing about four and a half five trillion dollars a year yeah and accelerating because it's always going to accelerate so yeah okay <laughs> you're going to replace the minute man the very very old minute man threes i mean, those things have got to be what about 40 years now old. The problem with those warheads too, um, for those who don't know how nuclear warhead works, you have critical mass of, of a nuclear fuel, uh, be it uh, plutonium or uranium, plutonium being uh, more enriched, uh, in other words, giving off more neutrons, uh, requires less uh, material for critical mass. So the, the split second you get critical mass, you get a critical, you get a nuclear chain reaction where more neutrons are hitting other atoms and releasing more neutrons than just flying off into space, and you get a nuclear blast. Uh, so, to avoid your nuclear missile going off all on its own, uh, all of these uh, components of that nuclear material are separated with lead. Thin sheets of lead keeps the neutrons from bouncing into more material and a critical mass. So, 
at, at a point of the detonation, uh, that material is combined. Uh, there's different ways. There's the pie uh, shape uh, method. There's the uh, donut and uh, plug and, and different other forms. Uh, but, you know, pre, pre-detonation, you'll get a small explosion in the warhead that drives these uh, pieces together and then you get critical mass. Well, while they're separated apart, they are still decaying. You have nuclear decay. You don't stop the nuclear decay. You just uh, keep it from uh, joining up and getting toward critical mass in the chain reaction. So a 40-year warhead is still shrinking in size. Literally, the nuclear material is shrinking in size. It's not shrinking a, a, a huge amount, but you got to understand one gram under critical mass and you don't have a chain reaction. So now the question becomes on these old warheads, is there still enough mass to, cha- to uh, cause a critical uh, chain reaction? Critical mass, chain reaction, big boom. Or is it just a little bit less and you get no big boom? You just get an explosion when the warhead hits and uh, radioactive material thrown all over the place and just make a big, big dirty bomb. A very, very expensive big, big dirty bomb. Uh, so that's a big difference. Whether you contaminate a, a, an area of maybe four, five, six hundred square meters with uh, radioactive material that can be found and they can be cleaned up uh, expensively, but can be cleaned up, or you get a big mushroom cloud. So the replacement for the Minuteman and the warheads, $10 billion a pop. You can't make this stuff up. Only the U.S. government could pay $100 billion for a one-off missile as a uh, first example case, and then $10 billion for the production case run for each. I mean, that's just, that's incredible money by any, any stretch of the imagination, by any standards. So U.S. tax peasants, uh, your great, great, great grandchildren will be paying this back. But of course, nobody's going to pay this back because it's like in any late empire with a devalued currency. Uh, the only thing saving the U.S. right now is uh, from total collapse. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, uh, depression, recession. We're talking total collapse and probably total political collapse is the fact it's still a reserve currency. Uh, though it's been losing reserve currency status globally uh, relatively quickly, de-dollarization. So the U.S., uh, in, its, in its infinite infantile wisdom, uh, the geriatric slash uh, ignorant uh, block of the U.S. Congress, which happens to be probably 95% of them, uh, they decided to push in sanctions to force Russia off the dollar fully. I mean, Russia more or less de- uh, de-dollarized anyways to a good extent, but far from fully. So now the U.S. government has made Russia de-dollarize fully. So the Russian stock exchange no longer trades uh, dollars and euro. Uh, and so all payments and anything is going to have to be in uh, rubles. Um, thank you. I don't know what else to say. Thank you. Thank God for morons. Or your enemies. <laughs> so, yeah, you're pushing us to do what we should have done 20 years ago. Uh, thank you. Uh, from the bottom of my heart. And I think I speak for the entire Russian nation. Thank you. Please give us some more. We got the Mir card uh, as an alternative to Visa and MasterCard. Because in 2014, Visa and MasterCard turned themselves uh, off in Russia for a week or two weeks. Can't remember totally. I think it was two weeks. As a punishment and warning. Okay, so that finally gave the political motivation for something that should have been done 10, uh, 10 years earlier, but wasn't done. The creation of Russia's own uh, credit card. Uh, again, thank you. Thank you very much. And the driving together of Russia and Iran and South, uh, North Korea, again, everything created in China, of course, everything uh, that the US fears the most, it does exactly that, to drive that. Because, as this old Chinese saying goes, if your only instrument is a hammer, all your problems become a nail. And that's all the U.S. knows. Beat everybody in the head and hope or demand that they do what you say. Um, Which rarely ever works, except for very small countries. And those, as uh, been shown by BRICS, uh, the first moment they get a chance to go screw you, they will go screw you. Now, uh, BRICS, by the way, which doubled in size last uh, year, there are, what, about 40 applicants? There are probably going to be another 20, 30 countries joining BRICS. 
Brooks already has the majority of the uh, economic might in the world because by neutral dollar standards, which is what is used to uh, to value uh, currency, well, to value economies, uh, China is well ahead of the U.S. now, and Russia is the fourth largest economy in the world. So you got the first and the fourth. Uh, if in India is in there, you got basically the third. Uh, so Germany and Japan dropped out to uh, uh, fifth and fourth place. Uh, I'm sorry, sixth and fifth place, and are continuing to shrink, especially Germany. But Japan's not far behind. Japan's going to shrink no matter what, because guess what? When you don't have kids, you shrink economically. And the mass depopulation that's coming through this world has already hit many countries. Again, look at North and South Korea. The future is behind North Korea. North Korea is traditional and has uh, lots of kids. So guess what? Their population is relatively young and growing. South Korea is has a birth rate that makes uh, Japan envious. Uh, <laughs> no, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, South Korea's uh, Japan. Uh, South Korea would be envious of Japan's birth rate. South Korea, I think, has the world's lowest birth rate. Basically, no kids. No kids. Um, like, less than, at about a third of what you need for a replacement rate. A very quickly aging population. That's South Korea. So, that means less workers, less soldiers, less consumption. Because old people don't buy things. Well, they don't buy many things. If they're really old, they don't buy much at all. They pay for health service. And they don't produce anything either, for the most part. They're aging out of uh, existence. So, there's a little problem right there. So what do you do? What do you do? Well, you get your birth rate up. But South Korea doesn't seem to be heading that way, just like Japan. So, North Korea doesn't have to have a war with South Korea. All it has to do is wait another 10, 15, 20 years, and South Korea is going to be with a heavily shrunken population. Drago. Ты что? А? Ты что? Дурной. Куда ты за машиной? Sorry about that. So, yeah, so basically, with a shrinking uh, population, you get a shrinking uh, workforce, you get shrunk, shrunken uh, demand. Uh, you can somewhat hold your economy together on exports, but considering that the majority of the world, particularly the richer countries like Europe, are all in uh, economic recession, depression, collapse, who are you going to export to, right? Uh, and as long as you stick with the U.S. and its bunch, uh, the global south is going to be looking at you as an enemy. And they're going to do business with the countries that are supporting it, not the countries that are exploiting it or trying to force it into uh, servitude. So there you go. There you go. And now, like Imre Vladimirovich is in Vietnam. And Vietnam, interestingly enough, after the Vietnamese War, is a pretty key uh, supplier to the U.S. I mean, like every... Uh, fifth piece of clothing worldwide is produced in Vietnam. Let, let that sink in. Uh, so yeah, the communists went very capitalist not long after being communists, because they never really were communists. I mean, you talk about a pointless war. Vietnam War was the pointless war. Consider uh, Ho Chi Minh originally came to the U.S. asking for help to get the French out. He was a nationalist. He wasn't a communist, per se. Uh, and when the U.S. Uh, backed the French to get the French back into NATO, or into NATO, um, that is after the French left NATO, and they left NATO because the CIA was helping uh, a group of French rebels try to overthrow de Gaulle, and they tried to murder de Gaulle and his family because de Gaulle wanted out of Algeria. So yeah, and de Gaulle was no leftist, so you can't even use that as an excuse. So yes. Since the U.S. has this tendency of screwing all of its allies, anybody with half a brain realizes that. Zelensky is not one of them. <laughs> and uh, luckily for the U.S., or maybe he does by now, but it's too late. Uh, so, yeah, De Gaulle uh, was less than happy with the U.S. So after he uh, knocked off uh, the, the rebels and some of the CIA crew uh, backing him, this is all part of the wider uh, Operation Gladius that was uh, taking place in all of Europe except for the Warsaw Pact countries. Look it up, read up about it. And parallelly, it was working with Operation Condor, which was working on uh, South Latin America. Same thing, basically. 
CIA takeovers of the governments or CIA terrorism to uh, force those governments to do as the CIA wanted. Yeah, yeah, that's the good guys, supposedly. So after that, the goal's uh, little additional revenge was removing uh, France from NATO. So to get France uh, into NATO, it's now back into NATO, the U.S. backed the French and Indochina, in this case Vietnam, and Ho Chi Minh went to the communists. Same thing happened, by the way, with Castro. Castro wasn't a communist. Castro got rid of Batista, a madman, a psychopath. And then uh, he was told, now you're going to be our boy in, uh, in Cuba, nothing's going to change. So, no. So they tried to kill him, and he went to the communists. So, you know, the CIA is its own, well, the U.S. in many cases is its own worst enemy, just out of sheer stupidity and uh, arrogance. So anyways, boys and girls, that's the end of today's uh, video. Hope you enjoy. God bless and support. Please uh, click uh, the like button. Please uh, subscribe, pass the video around. And if you want to support me at Patreon or buy me a coffee or drop me a donation directly in my bank account, I don't mind. Please do. Thank you very much. Cheers. Until next time. Say bye-bye, Drago. Woof, woof.